So uh, this is the marine data cluster session on interoperability for um, oceanographic data sets. And um, so uh, Steve's going to go ahead and run us through the introduction and we're going to have some great presentations and then have some um, collaborative breakout activities. So I guess Steve, if you want to go ahead and... Okay. Following the Haberman maneuver, um, welcome everybody. Um, and I wanted to introduce you to um, we have uh, five really good speakers, and I just wanted to try to uh, give you an idea of you know how these all fit together. So this is the the goose graphic of all ocean observations, and um, in particular, you can see this the glider down at the bottom that represents Guy's talk and the people that do things specific to a platform. But there's also um, CView that will be doing integrating across platform, as well as things that uh, lead us to more interoperability, such as provenance, where Biko Demo provenance and uh, Adam Shepard's talk um, uh, discusses. And so um, without further ado, I am going to stop sharing, hand it over to our first person is Fred. And okay. Fred, if you're ready, yeah, we are uh, good to go. All right, great. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for organizing this. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Spurs in, uh, in situ data set. Uh, apparently, my talk is what, how did they pronounce? Um, uh, pronounce it a uh, vanilla talk. So um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I was involved with these two uh, SPURS experiments, SPURS 1 and SPURS 2, and my job was to manage the data from this experiment. Uh, and I, I worked very hard on this with Vardis, who's here in the, in the session, and a number of other people. Uh, but um, so I wanted to acknowledge Vardis today. Oops. So Spurs 1 and Spurs 2, uh, Spurs, uh, uh, the Spurs field campaigns were conducted to study processes controlling sea surface salinity. So we had Spurs 1 in 2012 and 2013 in the evaporation dominated region of the subtropical North Atlantic. And Spurs 2 came in 2016 and 2017 in the precipitation dominated region of the Eastern Tropical Pacific. They were both uh, conducted around these more, these central moorings, which are located where you see the stars. And if you're interested in some of the scientific results, uh, the oceanography, there was a, a couple of oceanography special issues that came in uh, 2015 and 2019. And these experiments were mostly done to study and observe salinity in the upper ocean and, and how it works. So the, these field campaigns included in situ observations from all different kinds of platforms. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how many of these you recognize, but it was a very heterogeneous data set. There was, uh, um, platform, there was uh, data observed from ship, uh, profile data, as well as along track data, two different ships. We had a, a, a schooner uh, that was in, outfitted with instruments. It was really, really interesting. And a bunch of other uh, data streams that were both, uh, some, some were fairly normal, like, a, like um, an Argo float, uh, and some were more, let's say more, um, innovative like uh, the salinity snake or the sail drone. Uh, but there, there was a very large number of different platforms you know, that, that we got our data from. And, and dozens of different PIs involved in all this. My job as data manager was to try to understand these different types of instruments. The individual PIs, there was a, a couple of, uh, about a dozen of them uh, would so turn those data sets over to me. I would repackage the data in CF and ACDD compliant, NetCDF. 
submit it to Podak, uh, turn it over to Vardis, who would then check it and uh, um, invariably get back to me asking me to fix one thing or another. And then we would turn it into a final data set and write a final data report. And so all those data now are available at Podak uh, in a relatively final form. So the data sets that I received were from these different PIs, were from uh, uh, all kinds of different formats that I would get, uh, MATLAB files, CSV, text files, uh, various types of raw files coming directly off of instruments, and uh, also NetCDF uh, files. Uh, there was a diverse set of feature types, trajectories, profiles, time series, uh, time series profiles, and all, the, all this kind of thing. Um, and so we use these NODC inside two templates to try to make sense of all this. Sometimes the NetCDF files that I received were poorly formulated or they needed significant reorganization. Uh, and our job was to try to generate unified metadata so that all these files had, had a similar look and feel. Now, this is just example, an example of metadata from one particular data set that was collected as just XBT data, pretty standard type of a, a, data, a data stream. And, uh, and here's all the different types of metadata that we st stuck in there, uh, just, to, uh, just to give you an example. So here's the SPURS mission page, uh, SPURS data, all the SPURS data that have been submitted, ha have been, th that have been submitted to me that, that I know about are available here. Uh, there's, uh, we've also tried very hard to collect reports, references, other types of artifacts. Uh, I wrote a, 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 a big data submission report for uh, both SPURS 1 and SPURS 2 and, uh, and these, are, these are all available on the, the, the SPURS mission page. So I wanna talk just a little bit about S-Mode, which is a, an experiment that's coming up. Uh, that's the S-Mode is the sub-mesoscale ocean dynamics experiment. Uh, its goal is to quantify the role of vertical transport at small scales in the ocean. It's an oceanographic field campaign. It was actually set to start in the spring of this year in April, but we all know what happened. Uh, so at, at, at current, uh, the current status is it's going to be going out in the fall. Uh, we'll see whether that actually happens or not and, and how it might be modified uh, given current events. Uh, this one is an Earth Venture suborbital. Uh, so it's a much bigger deal than Spurs 1 and Spurs 2. There's, there's a lot more money involved. Uh, includes uh, a lot of the same type, types of insight to platforms and, and instruments as Spurs. Uh, but there's an addition of four different aircraft data sets. So it, it, it's, uh, it's going to be a bit of a challenge in that I'm going, going to be faced with having uh, aircraft data to deal with. Uh, something that I don't know that much about. but we'll soon be learning about. The region where it will be occurring is pictured up in the top right. It's off of San Francisco, uh, less than uh, a, a couple of hours flying time from um, the, uh, the, the NASA air station there at um, near San Jose. In S mode, so in, in SPURS, I simply accepted whatever data came from the PIs and reformatted it uh, to my own liking. We're going to have to be very, a, a lot more, uh, take a different strategy in S mode. Data submission requirements are a lot stricter. So with S mode, within six months of the end of each field campaign, we'll have to be submitting a finalized data to Podak, our, our data repository. Uh, so it, it's, um, in, with SPURS it took close to a couple of years to get those data ready. Uh, with S mode, we need to do it. We have a strict deadline of six months. Um, so the, the PIs are thus being asked to generate compliant files themselves. I had to write a formal data management plan. It's available online. Uh, it's quite a, a long and detailed and involved document. So we're going to have to do a lot more coordination before any instruments go in the water. 
uh, and this is uh, this is just a spreadsheet that Jack McNellis at Podak and I have been developing uh, for each data set. Each data set is a line, and each column is a is a metadata uh, attribute. And so we're we're pre-assigning these attributes to all these uh, these data sets, so that the PIs know how to uh, you know how to formulate their their files. Uh, so finally, uh, lessons learned. This is what I'm talking about is obviously a lot of hands-on work to get a well-formulated data set uh, that's a coordinated set of data uh, with a, a heterogeneous data, uh, set of instruments and platforms. Um, it's, it's a lot of hands-on work to get that done. Uh, so strong uh, coordination with the data repository is key and thus, uh, thus uh, my Help that I've gotten from Vardis has been essential. Uh, and uh, I'm working with Jack McNellis, who is the Podak person now uh, on S mode, who's been very, very helpful. Um, and my final uh, uh, thought here is a, is a, I guess a complaint is all, there's all these instrument manufacturers and they, they output data in their own formats. Why can't they just produce output uh, compliant NetCDF by default? Uh, to make all of this a whole lot easier. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Fred. That was <clears throat> that was really good. And I wanted to make a, um, mm -hmm. a plug. I see that there's a couple of questions in the chat. But before we get too far, yeah. we instituted a um, informal roundtable at OceanOBS, Fair mm -hmm. from the Sensor. And um, Seabird was one of the first to sign on. Um, because they know that they already have all the metadata that would make the uh, the metadata and the formats fair from the sensor ready for you and other people. And so if you need to know more about this movement, uh, contact me. Anyway, we have time for uh, a question or two. Uh, let's see from the chat. Uh, hey, Steve. Let's see. Yes, Matt. Is that Matt? No, it was Ted. No. Hey, Ted. Go for um, it. Hi. Nice talk, Fred. Uh, are are any of those sensor manufacturers that you mentioned providing sensor ML by any chance? Not that I know of. Yeah, because there was you know there was there was a big uh, effort in the OGC a while ago to try and get them to do that. As, yeah, and I'm, I mean the um, the sail drone people uh, are probably doing that. I'm I'm not really sure. Um, I'm, I, I really doubt any of the others are. We could certainly use some sensor ML people at the table, Ted. So um, let's talk about this offline and see if we can't use that as one of the ways that uh, the sensor manufacturers get more fair data or metadata uh, as part of their native output format. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so uh, let's move on. Uh, next up is Chris Olson talking about the CView project. Chris, go ahead and share your screen. And you have a con. All right, does everything look good? Everyone can hear me and everything? <laughs> Looks great. <laughs> Thanks, have to do the obligatory check. Um, so I'm going to talk about CView and I'm going to give a brief overview of what it is, um, but I really want to focus on some of the outcomes and lessons learned that come up that came up um, during working on this project that could hopefully be uh, good talking points for the later part of the session during the discussion. Um, so what is CView? Uh, CView is an integrated activity, uh, EarthCube integrated activity. Uh, between about 2016 and 2018. I don't remember the exact dates, but so this, this has been completed. Uh, it was a collaboration between people from different data repositories working to integrate uh, data into a common platform. Um, and the motivators for this were driven a lot by uh, a workshop and scientists interviews to gauge priorities and give direction. Um, the community resources that we use, uh, 
the data facilities that we pulled from were the Biological Chemical Oceanography Data Management Office, um, Clavar Carbon Hydro Hydrographic Data Office, uh, OBIS. OBIS is a species count or uh, fish occurrence data in the ocean and rolling deck to repository, which is underway data collected on research cruises. So these were the four data centers that we were getting data from. And the tool that we chose to integrate this data into uh, is a software package called Ocean Data View written by Reiner Schlitzer of AWI. Uh, it it's, has a lot of following in the physical oceanographic community and has capabilities for plotting profile data, surface data, as well as trajectory. So here's the basic principle. We're looking at two data sets here, one from Biko Demo, who refers to this cruise as TN303 and CCHGO, which identifies it with this cruise identifier. When we plot up, we can see it's clearly the same data, but is, is treated completely separately in the two different data centers. Um, so the basic principle is just to take data like this and combine it in the ODV. So our method of integrating data sets first was establish a background relatedness, whether this be spatio-temporal relatedness, or if it was the same cruise, or perhaps it was a, a topic of interest. Um, reformatting was uh, pretty <laughs> trivial, putting it into a generic format. Um, then there was uh, combining the data and the metadata, essentially creating a superset and combining it all. And then the more difficult part was this harmonization that came about trying to massage the data to fit well together. So some hard outcomes, we did this for four themed collections, um, again, based off of scientists and user input. Uh, the files are available both as collections that can be downloaded, flat file downloads, and we also set up a threads service for subsetting and um, accessing remotely through uh, different programming languages. MATLAB, Python, R are the ones that we focused on, but uh, anything that can speak OpenDAP can talk to this thread server. So these are the thematic data collections that we built, uh, Hawaiian Ocean Time Series Collection, Bermuda Atlantic Time Series Collection, uh, the Pioneer Area Array, essentially the OOI Pioneer Array. We went to that area and we just found everything we could in that geographic region across the four data centers and integrated it. And then our final package was a Southern Ocean data collection where we focused on data from the Southern Ocean. Um, these packages are up on our up on this website, cviewdata.org. There's also, as I mentioned before, uh, this is where the thread server resides and you can access the data that way. So some of the softer outcomes for me, I learned a lot and saw a lot of intrinsic value in just going and trying to merge all of this data. Um, it was very nice that it was a collaboration between different data centers. Uh, just that cross-pollination that took place, learning how other people do things, um, just sharing sharing ideas and also that led to sharing metadata and talking a little bit more and doing some reciprocal linking um, because one of the hardest things that we did was find where we do have overlap um, and then making that overlap a little bit more apparent going forward um, for me it was a bit of a fair reality check uh, this idea of findable accessible interoperable reusable I think it's a really good exercise to go to your own data center and try and download data and actually see how much of what is what you know exists in your data center is actually that findable for you. Because if you can't find it, others are probably going to have struggles as well. Um, there were some real world gotchas and learning experiences that I think I'm going to talk about in a minute. 
Um, another thing that I think is very important that came out of this project is uh, early career training and experience, both for me and we hired an undergrad that did a lot of the work. Um, I always think that that is very valuable. So an example of some of these gotchas and things that came up um, that I want to point out. Again, there's a lot that we learned, but I'm going to highlight just a couple of things. Um, there is this sort of philosophy around identifiers. And in general, oceanography seems to be organized around this idea of a cruise. Um, and cruise identifiers tend to have this historic meaning. Um, so for example, we look here, OC 1806A. Um, the meaning of this is it's on the vessel Oceanus and it is the sixth cruise in 2018 and part A. Um, so this can be a little bit problematic because in my view, identifiers should be unique and not really contain any metadata because is, as much as we like to think that metadata doesn't change, metadata changes. So uh, if you have all of your data organized around this identifier, and then you realize, oh, the start date of this cruise um, was updated because it was wrong in some catalog somewhere. Now, all of a sudden you have to change an identifier and there was a lot of headaches that came around that. This is actually something that happened um, and really was a surprise for all of us. Um, and then on the flip side of that, these scientists are used to these identifiers. So they're very, it doesn't make sense to go in and just upend a system because it, it creates problems maintaining it. Like our job as data providers is to find a way to facilitate these, um, not change them. So not just upend the system. Another example was in mapping parameters and vocabularies. Um, in merging all of this data, we, there was a lot of parameters and we tried to assign a lot of um, control vocabulary names to these. And this ended up being having a lot of subtleties to it. For example, you look at two parameters that are oxygen measurements, but maybe one is actually collected from a water sample that was then taken to a lab and measured. And maybe another was um, measured directly from a digital sensor. So is calling these two things the same thing really right? And you know, making those decisions without a, a domain expert in the room proved to be difficult. And I think that was one of the big takeaways with this is you know, we need to work very closely with these domain experts to, to do this. Um, the other thing is a lot of these parameter names tended to have significant meaning to these domain experts. Um, so if like they, they could even see the name of a parameter and the way it was formatted and realize what instrument it came from. So to so our goal is with this control vocabularies is to add value, add a, a parameter that makes it more discoverable without kind of hiding these key parameter names that people really rely on farther back in the metadata, still have them be very prominent. Um, one more thing that proved difficult that I want to talk about was integrating data of different types. Most of the data that we dealt with tended to be profile data through the water column, um, but specifically with this species count and um, species occurrence data that we were getting from OBIS, it was really hard to integrate, to sort of put that in the same format. Um, because you can think of it as almost like point cloud data within the water column, the occurrence of a fish or the occurrence of a dolphin, something like that. Um, so there are trade-offs in formats and performance and trying to do that. So uh, that is a consideration and we did have to get creative. So that was very interesting. Um, again, that was, those were just a couple of things that we learned. Uh, Hopefully that can be launching a launching off point for discussion later, but 
that's all I have for now. And um, are there any questions? Thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> if you can unshare your screen for the next presenter. Um, it looks, if you look in uh, chat, and we're a little tight on time, um, and I may relegate the uh, questions to the to the end for everybody. This is exactly why this session exists: is for people to come in, look at some of the success stories, and then uh, subsequently uh, contribute what they know that's happening in adjacent domains that may be helpful. I should remind you that uh, CFU was a few years ago before a lot of the current things uh, that we're talking about in chat were developed or accepted, so we can temper um, what we say with that. All right. Um, next up, we have uh, Guy Castileo, and he's going to talk about underwater colliders. So, Guy, you got it. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Oh, okay. Full screen now, correct? You are yes, good sir. to go. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, my name is Guilherme Castelo. Uh, you can call me just Guy. I'm from the Instrument Development Group uh, from Scripps. And uh, today I'm talking about uh, spray and the water glider data. Everything that, uh, can you see my, my mouse, my cursor here? Uh, I hope so. Uh, yes, everything yes. That I, fantastic, thank you. Everything that I talk today, you can find on this, uh, on our spray data website. And uh, thanks Caroline and Steve for the opportunity here. Uh, if you don't know what is a spray, it's an uh, underwater glider which means that there's autonomous platforms that dives every time it comes to the surface, connect to the satellite, gets a GPS position and can transmit real time data for us. Uh, these sprays are uh, uh, loaded with CTDs, but uh, the full payload is defined by the scientific question of that mission, which means that we can have a variety of, of uh, combinations of uh, available variables on each data set. Uh, here on the right, we have the California Underwater Glider Network. It's the longest uh, uh, glider uh, operational uh, observation. And uh, these are three sections, the Cal Coffee lines, where we had maintaining uh, spray gliders, one all the time on each line since 2006. And uh, each orange dot here is a profile. And to give a perspective, uh, we produce around eight profiles a day. Most of what I'm talking today is about the delayed mode once we recover the equipment and uh, have the full uh, information on that. So uh, the gliders are uh, ideal for regional work, which naturally defines a domain for this data. So we provide our data grouped in data sets per project. After uh, processed and uh, quality controlled and, and uh, normalized for regular depths, this means that we have files with less than 150 megabytes per project. Uh, this important information that drives a lot of our decisions on, on how to distribute data and how to organize things. Uh, here on the right is a snapshot of the website and the section of the projects, some of the projects uh, that are public. And for each one of these projects, we'll have the list of files, uh, uh, full data sets for that. Uh, we use NetCDF. For us, it's just perfect solution for this, considering the size and how easy it is to, to augment with, uh, with the metadata. And so NetCDF is our, our preferred choice. These NetCDFs, uh, they conform with uh, CF and uh, ACDD conventions. Uh, we use uh, uh, varieties of the trajectory profile, uh, different modifications, and most of the public data is uh, are on regular arrays. Uh, we have been using this uh, template for, uh, I think, four years now. So I'm excited to, to uh, consider the idea of updating these and taking advantage of uh, CF uh, 1.8. I'm really excited to, to adopt the strings, uh, groups, and flags. I think it's, it's great, uh, was a great improvement from CF 1.8, and will make uh, our files more clean and, and uh, uh, easier to understand. You see uh, in some slides, uh, some things on the, on the bottom. So these are people that I worked with or I learned from on those subjects. And uh, I, I have, uh, I'm, I'm really thankful for, for all these people. Uh, here on the right is, uh, is just parts of a CDL of one of those files. And uh, I'd like to call attention here 
the way how we handle uh, best practice is we try specific problems. We try to produce um, on the group, the team, creates a, a publication, specific publications, peer reviewed, and uh, describing the methodology or the characteristics of that. So it's, it's an approach more uh, bottom up for uh, a best practice, right? Like my perspective is similar to, to open source, right? Well, you, you publish and, and then the community decides what uh, believes most, right? Uh, probably the biggest impact for data structure on gliders is coming from the ocean gliders, which is a, a worldwide uh, effort. And inside the ocean gliders, there is a task team uh, specific about the, the data structure with the goal to harmonize the different uh, standards that we see. So, so right now, the most common ones are the, the used by US, uh, Australia, and uh, Europe. And uh, on the first uh, uh, phase of, of of this effort was to identify the, the characteristics of each one of the standards, what, what was good, what was special, what was good ideas, and what we wanted that every everybody should have, should contain, should not miss or desire it. And uh, we hope to, to finish this by uh, before the end of the year with this recommendation. Uh, the hardest part here, as, as mentioned, I think by, by Chris, was the, the partial overlap when we have information that they are related, but they are not exactly the same. So it's, it's how to deal with this, this uh, harmonization for the both, such satisfy the both sides. Uh, so that this new, uh, this OG 1.0 would uh, uh, conform and extend CF and CDD, uh, aggregate some specific needs for, uh, for the glides. For instance, one example is, is, is we have the GPS only once the glider is on the surface, when usually we have the CTD off. So we have the latitude GPS and the latitude that's the interpolated one on the subsurface, which some people like to, to work with that. Uh, another important one is the phase, phase on the diving. So that measure was, was done during the sanding phase, the sanding phase or, or just surfacing. And uh, yes, so one recent discussion that I found quite interesting, and that some of information on, on our files from Spray, I was storing as attributes on, on the NetCD apps. And then I realized that that was a big trouble uh, if you try to do aggregation and, and would not have an easy solution to preserve that information. So uh, that should be actually uh, go as auxiliary variables. Uh, we use DOIs not with the goal of uh, uh, resolving reproducibility, but the, the intention here is different, is to track scientific impact. And with that purpose, uh, I use a DOI on the level of project, and which means that different files can have the same DOI as long as they are from the same project. And that DOI is the DOI that you ask for the user of that data to cite. So it's, it's, the goal here is, is track uh, scientific impact of that project. Uh, for reproducibility, I have a history of all the files produced, so which means that if we know the date when it's downloaded, I can go back. Uh, that's something that uh, I could do a better job on this, but uh, I just need time <laughs> to, to address that. Uh, those NETS CDFs, we, we expand the, the capability of them uh, with RDAP. We have a dedicated uh, RDAP server, which allows uh, conversion for different formats, uh, subsampling, selecting, cropping, uh, RESTful queries. Uh, but I'd like to emphasize that, that most of our users, because the, the, the size of the files are relatively small, they prefer to just download the whole thing and, and operate on, on their environment. But we, we, we do have that resource. Um, OK, so since this uh, uh, interoperability uh, group discussion, uh, I'd like to raise the, a question and, and actually uh, ask for advice for, for the community. One of the, the, the problems that I, that I deal is uh, I do the calibration of the chlorophyll estimated from, from spray. And uh, so here on, on this figure, we have the same sections of spray and the and the contour is uh, Modis Aqua uh, estimate of uh, chlorophyll. 
And uh, I used the, the, the satellite to, to calibrate the, the spray. And although they both of spray and satellite, they're calibrated to see chlorophyll, and we have the information of the geolocation, the time, uh, we have the same unit, it's, it's the same variable, but the perspective of the satellite is completely different than the spray. Why, why the satellite is, is looking for an integrated view until a certain depth, bias by, by the depth, we have a spray with discrete vertical uh, pontal samples. So right now, my file do not have any information that a machine-to-machine -machine communication could tell these two data, they are related, but they cannot be placed side by side. There, there are intrinsic difference on them. And, and I, as far as I know, I don't think I have any information in my files that would allow a machine-to-machine -machine decision on that level. And actually even further, what I really would like to do is how could I tell the machine what would be the procedure that could be done automatically to be able to compare this, this, these two measurements? Uh, yes, that's what I have to talk today. Thank you. All right, thanks, Guy. Um, we have about 30 seconds for one. For one question, if you want to pop up really quickly, let's see what we have in chat. Oh, wow. Um, I would be happy to talk to you about that afterward. The great. Who is that? This is, sorry, this is Kai Blumberg. I'm the, 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 the community fellow for this session. I have some ideas or thoughts on that. So not, not pretending Fantastic. to have some ideas and thoughts. We could talk later. Perfect. Thank you. OK. All right. Um, Let's move on. Uh, next up, we have Vardis Santos talking about animal tracking data. Go ahead and share your screen, Vardis, and go into presenter mode, and you got it. Hi, everyone. Great. Can everyone uh, hear me and see my screen? Got both. You Great. sound and look good. Excellent. So uh, that was a great introduction because now we're going to be talking about biological gliders. And there's some additional challenges associated with some of these animal telemetry data sets. But that also sort of reinforce some of the general issues that have been raised to this point. Uh, and a lot of this work was actually done under an, a NASA access funded uh, project called uh, OIP, or Oceanographic in Situ Data Interoperability Project. And one of the products of this was a, uh, a NetCDF uh, standards-based specification for electronic tagging data. I'd like to acknowledge my co-eyes on that project, uh, Tim Lam and Sean Arms from Unidata. Okay, uh, so as I said, yeah, we're talking about uh, deployments of uh, tags, uh, sensors basically, on biological platforms. And uh, the data that you get out of these are sort of trajectory, tra trajectory profile data. Now there's different types of uh, tags. You have spot tags that uh, sort of transmit positions to satellites. You have others with no environmental data, just the positions. Then you have implantable tags that are surgically inserted into the animal um, and record environmental measurements. And then you have, uh, pop-up archival tags that uh, record measurements. Um, they're basically attached to the animal externally and then they pop off at, after some time uh, period that's programmed by the researcher and then they transmit data to the satellite. So those are the typical classes of uh, animal telemetry tags. There's also acoustic tags, uh, which basically record presence, absence type information around uh, listening stations, but uh, I'm not going to be talking about those here. So the typical information you get from these, uh, you know, minimally uh, light level, pressure, uh, depth, temperature, and, and position in some combination of these. And uh, these are exceedingly fascinating data sets. These animals undertake uh, somewhat extraordinary uh, movements and migrations over their, over their life histories. Um, and they're also invaluable data for uh, both for oceanographic research and uh, operations, but also for fisheries management, critical information on stocks, st spatial structure. And as a consequence, there's been a, a large number of deployments of 
tagging data by many different agencies and individual researchers over time. And this has sort of uh, culminated in the development of these uh, national data assembly centers uh, here in the US, uh, the, the IUS Animal Tele Telemetry Network in Australia, IMOS, uh, ATF, okay? And now these uh, national centers are organizing internationally and they have uh, recently submitted a, uh, a proposal that's been approved uh, to become a formal element, observing element within the global ocean observing system. But to do this, uh, for these uh, initiatives to succeed, uh, especially when you're talking about operational data systems, uh, data interoperability is a key and critical to success. Oops, I'm going in the wrong direction. There we go. And, uh, and again. Okay, so what are the challenges? Oops. Uh, the first challenge is that uh, there's extreme heterogeneity in the native file formats produced by the instrument uh, manufacturer software. And as you can see, these are highly heterogeneous, uh, typically ad hoc ASCII CSV type formats uh, with uh, very limited metadata. At best, at times, some kind of uh, column header and maybe a, a couple of rows of some esoteric information. So that's a key problem. Um, obviously, none of the stuff is standards compliant and uh, reusable. So to address these problems, as was stated before, there really needs to be a, a sustained effort to engage with the uh, tag instrument manufacturers themselves. And in fact, in the OIP project, uh, we had uh, one of the leading tag manufacturers, Wildlife Computers, as one of our collaborators. The intent being to try to educate them about some of these uh, data, data standards issues. Challenge number two is that uh, you, yes, you have the typical kind of time series at depth and position type information for some of the, the tag data types. But then for the pop-up archival, you know, uh, what they actually transmit to, to satellite are summarized uh, data, okay, at some pre-described uh, time interval. It could be daily, uh, six hourly, whatever the researcher programs into the, into the tag. So what are the best practices uh, within a kind of CF framework to represent these uh, summary type of data sets? which are typically in the case of these uh, PAT tags, uh, they are bin frequency type information. Uh, and there's two types. There's sort of these static bins that the, that the researcher pre-programs in advance. But there's also these PDT series, which are basically dynamic bins. So over the course of the day, uh, the fish may change its depth distribution, say, and, and essentially in these PDTs, a dynamic uh, binning scheme is applied uh, to those daily daily positions. So that's challenge number two. Challenge number three is uh, how do you represent a positional uncertainty in these data sets? And uh, which is a major issue for animal telemetry data, okay? Uh, and of course, you know, this is not unique just to animal telemetry, even Argo profiling floats have uh, positional uncertainty associated with them. How do you represent that uh, error kind of information? And that's very important. So we have two use cases here. Uh, basically, in the case of uh, these archival and pop-up tags, uh, the positions are actually indirectly measured based on light level. Okay, so these are not the positions are not direct measurements, sort of GPS type measurements of position. They're basically estimated from light. Uh, light level that the sensor, uh, sensor uh, picks up. And of course, there's potentially large errors associated with this, but there are methods available, state space models, Kalman filters, various other techniques for do these to, to undertake geocorrections on the positional information. So once these geocorrections are made, how do you actually represent those uh, positional uncertainties, those envelopes? Uh, in the tag, with the tag data themselves, and also record the method by which that geocorrection happened, right? Because different uh, uh, analyses uh, techniques can produce quite different results. 
the, the other aspect is, say, for spot tags, uh, or once these uh, pop-up archival tags come to the surface and, and start transmitting positions to Argo satellites, there is <coughs> uh, uncertainty associated with the Argo position, so a quality code that Argo provides for uh, the precision of the geolocation, or rather the accuracy of the geolocation. So how do we represent this kind of information as well? Uh, the, the, third, the fourth challenge is we're dealing with biological data and deployments of tags on biological platforms. So there's much more, uh, there's additional metadata pertaining to these deployments, a richer set of metadata that uh, really need to be captured in order uh, to properly describe the deployment, the performance of the tag, and to facilitate a re, uh, robust uh, scientific interpretation of these data sets, okay, over time. And to ensure that these data are preserved in, a, in a, an archived in a fully described uh, state. So what we did in OIP was actually uh, have working sessions with uh, researchers, um, experts in the, in the tagging domain and compile these lists of, of uh, metadata that they would like packaged in these data files together with the data. Uh, and there was quite a long list. Uh, we came up with these 10 different categories and we dispositioned the attributes as, as to whether they should be considered uh, required, optional, or recommended. And uh, 30 of the 130 were considered to be mandatory. And then uh, we developed a framework for actually packaging these metadata within a uh, NetCDF file using this group construct that is now available. Okay, so um, those were some recommendations that came out. Uh, what is being done, what has been done historically in terms of uh, standards for animal telemetry data? The first foray into this and a wonderful project, if you're not aware of it, is this MIOP, uh, International Consortium for Animal Telemetry, uh, for uh, Marine Mammal Telemetry Data. And what they very intelligently did was they leveraged the, the NetCDF core Argo profile uh, format to uh, package their marine mammal data. And why was this important? Uh, because it provided a, a standards-based inter, uh, interoperable format that could be widely used by the oceanographic community, something that they were very familiar with. But, you know, MIOP only represents a certain type of, of uh, animal telemetry da data, and as I said, there's a greater diversity of tag types. And so that led to this formulation and development of this NC uh, ETAG specification. And as I said, um, it's... Um, uh, basically deals with both continuous data series and these discrete summary type data, supports the range of key electronic data uh, class types, uh, rich domain metadata, et etc. et cetera, the, the key challenges that we were facing. And we've published these specifications for the community. Just concluding, uh, some key takeout points uh, from this, and I, I believe probably also some of the other presentations. So data interoperability stands are critical for the long-term preservation of data, their correct scientific usage, and assimilation into automated workflows. Uh, at times, these things are considered by the community as a hindrance, but they should instead be viewed as an enabler of efficient reproducible science. And uh, we've showed that the development of these uh, standards for animal telemetry data is a tractable problem and that they align with prevailing earth science uh, observation data standards that are used. Uh, but we needed also to extend those and involve the community in uh, developing some of those extensions, okay? Another key point, standards alone don't suffice, okay? Uh, we need software tools to facilitate implementation for broader uptake by the community. And there has to be an outreach component in order for the community to understand the value of them going to the effort of uh, producing this information and these standards compliant files. Thank you. Evartis, that was great, Ed. Really good contrast. Um, uh, with the Gladder talk before and a lot of similarities and a lot of differences between the implementation of the data and metadata. Um, we have about a uh, half a minute if somebody feels like they have a very, very urgent question for Vardis. 
just ring in and go for it. Yes, so there's, I see a question from uh, Ted on how the adoption of uh, NC tag is going. Basically, it, uh, it was helpful to the Anibos uh, Goose application because uh, they could cite this as, a, um, as, a in, as part of their sort of data standards uh, for that, that initiative. They were able to cite a concrete specification uh, that, that they could leverage. And going forward, I think they'll be using that. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Okay, guys. okay. Um, let's go ahead. Uh, Adam is up next. He's the anchor leg in this relay, um, tying it all together with provenance from Pico Demo. So go for it, Adam. We have thanks, your Steve. presentation and your audio. You're looking good. Good. Okay. Great. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, let me see if I can get in presenter mode here. All right, so uh, in 1997, uh, audiences in the US were treated to a new version of a, a much beloved movie called Star Wars. And uh, you know, I think most folks were delighted coming out of that experience, but I think a lot of folks that saw that film in 1997 had one burning question, uh, and that was, did Han shoot first? Uh, and so if you aren't aware of this story, uh, in 1997, Han is a protagonist on the left here in the picture. And um, he shot first in 1997, killing uh, someone in a, in, a, in a bar discussion. Uh, and in the new version, uh, the author of this movie edited in a laser shot coming from the villain in this case uh, to make it so that Han did not shoot first. Uh, and what's interesting is that the author in a 2004 interview said, to me, the original movie doesn't really exist anymore. I'm sorry you saw half a completed film and fell in love with it, but I want it to be the way I want it to be. And so, you know, there was this disturbance in the force here. Now we have an audience uh, that is really attached to this older version, the author of this creative work, uh, really promoting this newer version, but we really don't have a bridge as to what happened and why. And for audiences, that really comes down to the fact that they attached themselves and drew value out of the old original version. Uh, and then some might have preferred the newer version. And so there's this fraction or, or fracture rather in, in the audiences here surrounding this creative work. Uh, and so what does this mean for data? You know, philosophically, there's no issue with versioning creative works. We have techniques uh, and metadata to describe these types of events. Um, but I think where we lack, especially in data repository lands, is how do we explain what happened to those who don't necessarily know yet? So that when they they come to a version of a data set, they understand the history of why it's been changed. So let me give you a case study. Uh, this is a data set here that was submitted to uh, Bico Demo. Uh, and what's happening here is that an observation has been made at a location uh, of a particular station or multiple stations uh, at certain depths. And what the author did uh, is combine the station and depths so that they could get a visual representation of this data to help them analyze and make sense of the observations that were made. But, you know, in terms of fair data, you know, this type of representation of data doesn't really help folks that are wanting to search and query data or data catalogs for measurements of depth uh, and station, and, and let's say uh, provide filters on those for, for finding data that they really want. And so in an effort of fairness, we wanna make these data sets findable for, for folks that are interested in unique descriptions of stations or depths. We also wanna make sure that these, and I know this is a reproducibility talk, so to link it to the interoperability uh, topic here in this session, um, we want to link these columns in, in data sets or tabular data sets to uh, community vocabularies to improve uh, findability and interoperability with other data sets. But really here, what I'm interested in is the reusability aspect of uh, data versioning. Uh, and so really it's that metadata with provenance that we can use to describe this uh, change uh, in this station depth column into these new two columns of station and depth individually. And so we have a tale of two versions. We've got original data that's very valuable to that particular scientist and maybe scientists in that domain uh, who find value in that visualization of the data. Uh, but there might be other communities that find more value in a different updated version of that data. 
And so the question becomes, how do we describe what happened? Uh, and so what we've done in the past at Bico Demo is, is provide um, natural language descriptions of what we've done to describe that. And that's great. And maybe a human can take that description and replicate the process, uh, but maybe not. And so the implication for machines as we move into data being more broadly uh, ac accessible from machines and being able to draw up these uh, machine actionable syntheses of data, uh, this becomes even harder for a machine to decipher what to do uh, as it's looking at two different versions of data. And so what we've decided on at Bico Demo is that instead of ad hoc scripting by our data managers, so writing code to describe how these new versions were generated, we've decided to use a technique called the declarative workflows. And so I just want to describe really quickly what declarative workflows look like. It's essentially a set of steps to execute. And so it might be, um, the definition of a particular step, each step has a name, and then each step also has inputs into that name. Names are representative of some type of action that should be performed on that data set. And then there are more steps added into this declarative workflow. So you're essentially building out steps to process uh, this data. And what's, I mean, so that doesn't sound like anything new. We've been doing this for a long time. Uh, clearly, this is something that we do in code. But what's interesting about declarative workflows is the way that it's structured. It's, it's structured as configuration. Uh, it can be treated as data itself. Uh, and so just here's an example of one of these particular steps. So uh, this data set had, uh, this is a different data set than the station depth um, example that I showed earlier. But this particular data set has uh, latitude, longitude combined in a, a single column and described as a decimal degree minutes. And so what this step wants to do is extract out the latitude and put it in a separate column. And so this is an example of what that might do. Uh, and so here we see the combined lat long in a single column and then splitting out into two separate columns, the latitude and longitude as decimal degrees. All right, so um, a little bit back to the philosophy now of why declarative workflows are useful. Um, why not just reuse code? Um, well, for us as data managers, you know, we've got multiple data managers working across data. And so it's almost easier to teach data managers uh, who might not be uh, well versed in, in code uh, what to be, what should be done over necessarily how to do it. And, and that really revolves around this idea that declarative workflows as data describe what to do as opposed to how to do it. And so we leave how best to do it to the software implementations. Uh, and I'll show you that here in a second. Also, as data, you know, these declarative workflows have a longer shelf life than code. Um, we have provenance records and data that date back to, gosh, like Matt probably knows better than I here in the session, but uh, decades. Uh, and I don't know if there's many software packages uh, that we are still using uh, decades on. Uh, but also, and what's interesting about declarative workflows and how it ties into provenance is that these workflows, because they're stored as data, are easier to manage. And then because they're data, we can query and assess them. And so let's say we had a particular step or process in a bunch of data sets that uh, was wrong or, you know, just it was producing wrong values. We can query that data or all the collective declarative workflows that we've built up and say, hey, show me all the data sets that were processed using this particular step so that we can figure out which data sets need to be corrected. And in that regards, declarative workflows can serve as provenance. And so these, these declarative workflows stored in a format like JSON or YAML can easily be converted into these data models such as ProvO or, or ProvDM rather where we can describe the raw data set, how a pipeline or a declarative workflow uh, used that raw data set to generate a new processed uh, version. And that can all be made accessible and queryable uh, to, uh, to the end users. All right, and so what this prov does is really essentially describe for us at Bico Demo how the original data submitted into the repository has been changed so that it's 
more fair and, and then put it into the archive. And that provenance really gives us the link that joins this original data set to that archive data to end up at, at a fair uh, product. Um, I know that was very quick, um, but I just wanted to highlight quickly the tools that we use so that we can get to um, the uh, discussion part of the, the session here. So we're using a, a package called uh, Frictionless Data. And uh, the declarative workflows we use is, is built on a Python project called Dataflows. Uh, Dataflows comes with a dozen or so just typical out of the box uh, processors that you could use to sort of flip data sets, um, add columns, remove columns, uh, that type of thing. And then BicoDemo wrote its own set of processors to do more uh, ocean data operations on that. Uh, we wrote a blog post with um, uh, Open Knowledge Foundation, and you can find that at the link for more information uh, about the work that we've been doing here and a little bit more description on the, the lightweight UI that we built on top of that uh, to help our data managers with consistency as they build out these workflows. So um, yeah, that's all I've got for now. Uh, are there any questions? Adam, thanks a lot. Um, and I should let everybody know that all of the presentations here are um, in the Kiko chat uh, inset with the Google Doc in it. So you can go and peruse them and find the links. Um, if you have uh, questions for Adam, if you could pop them into chat, that would be great. We had um, we had a back to back presentations going pretty quickly. And we want to get on to the next activity. So I'm going to hand it over to Carolina, the co uh, chair of this uh, cluster. And uh, she's going to tell you about the next activity. Carolina? Yeah, so um, those are some great presentations. And we're going to do kind of a three part discussion um, activity. So um, let me see if I can. Um, so we're going to do so three parts. So we're going to um, go into breakout rooms and um, every breakout room is going to fill in a slide with the questions of, uh, in this context, what is working, what is not working, and what can the marine data cluster do to help. Um, so, um, and the idea is that we don't have much time, but we're just going to kind of do a scoping exercise that hopefully will lead to more um, discussions on future calls for the marine data cluster. So uh, before we go into the breakout rooms, though, it was nice to get people kind of to maybe synthesize what they just heard in their pre presentations and to brainstorm a little bit. So we're going to do a silent Google docking um, exercise. And I am going to go ahead and put the link to the Google Doc in the chat. And so everyone can work on these uh, seed questions, which I'm going to go ahead and um, share. Um, so actually, let's, oops, that wasn't right. Present. Can everyone see the seed questions? Um, so, uh, so if everyone would just go to that link in the Google Doc, and then there is a section for each of these sections, these questions, and the idea is to kind of brainstorm a little bit with these uh, thought experiments, and then just for five minutes, so I can actually start the the timer on that. So just at two ten, we'll stop, and then um, actually at two, let's say two eight. And then um, we're going to go into breakout rooms and then answer those questions of what's working, what's not working, and how can the marine data cluster help. Um, and then just at the last 10 minutes of the session, come back together as the larger group and try to put together some takeaways, which then um, will lead to follow up uh, on calls for the marine data cluster. So is that um, sound good? Let me see if people are actually all right, which, we have a couple of questions in chat. Okay. Which link are you wanting people to follow? Um, did I not put the link? You, it's, oh, just, you know it's down near the bottom of the you know, of the document that's in Kiko chat. Yeah, uh, sorry, I uh, accidentally just hit that to a, a single person because there was chat going on. So um, I, I just put that link into the chat and it is Yes, in the Google Doc, um, in the Kiko chat, and in the Kiko chat at the very beginning, there's a long um, table of contents, and those are all linked to the notes as well. So that last link I just put into the chat should get, take you right to the correct section. 
and let's see how this goes. So, um, great. Looks like people are. Um, so I'll maybe read off some of the the seed thought experiments. Is um, you know, first and foremost, what are you know unique issues to in situ oceanographic data sets, and then what are commonalities to other types of data sets, um, and then uh, thinking about like how you could combine different um, different data types uh, together, and then assuming this is a fun one is assuming that everything's perfect and everything uh, all data sets are interoperable, whatever that means. Uh, then what can you do with it? Um, so that's that's kind of a nice, um, expansive question. So I'll be quiet. And then Okay, so it looks like people are still writing a, a little bit. So go ahead and um, wrap up uh, your sentence. And then um, Megan is gonna put us into breakout rooms and there's going to be, um, I think it's gonna be five to a room. Um, and so then you can um, put your notes into this slide right below the Google docking um, section. There's um, uh, breakout room just dis uh, discussions and that those are linked to each slide and then you can just answer those three questions of what's working what's not working and how the marine data cluster can help um, and I'll go ahead and put those links really know um, what's the time how many minutes oh the time uh, 10 minutes okay. so we'll do 10 minutes um, unless um, I think yeah all right, let me Unless know when you want to do longer in the, I think that's fine. Okay. That looks great. Should I open the rooms up now? Yes. All right, as people are dropping off, don't go anywhere. This is going to be fun.
So in order to join the breakout rooms, you have to accept the little, there should be a little pop-up that asks you to do that. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Great. You fixed it just in time. Uh. Okay, great. I hope, was everyone able to find the, the slides to take notes in? I was, you know, uh, I felt like maybe, maybe we just dropped you off in, in the middle of the woods, like, okay, find your way home. I guess it was fine. We took uh, notes in the Google Doc, is that, perfect. is that wrong? No, no, that's, that's great. <laughs> um, yes, that, that's, um, that's great. Um, so, I guess we can do a, a quick report out by room um, and then find um, maybe focusing on the, the section of like, you know, uh, what the marine data cluster can do to help because the idea is that kind of, this is gonna be an ongoing, um, you know, conversation. This was, this was not a lot of time, but okay, I'll get into it. So uh, we were room one. And um, so things that we're, we're working were NetCDF, CF, ACDD, ERDAP, and um, R to R cruise documentation, and in general, cruise metadata. But maybe what could uh, use more work is um, actual uh, implementation of like uh, metadata standards within data, and um, particularly like image data sets were brought up as there's no standards. Um, cloud um, technologies are uh, promising, but there's still not a lot of implementation with. Um, like small data sets, it's all, you know, kind of satellite um, data. And um, so what could be better was um, maybe the marine data cluster could help to uh, encourage the adoption of uh, methods and best practices and to address broken links across the value chain. So that's kind of like between managers and scientists and then also repositories and end users. So kind of identify where um, these communications are breaking down. and directly from the sensor manufacturers is that the community needs to speak with one voice. So that's a tall order, but um, that's very clear, right? Like they're, they're not going to do anything unless they have distinct, um, uh, you know, direction with, with one single voice. And um, so also embedding software developers within science teams. Um, and this kind of ties into kind of like, you know, good data management plans starting early in the process. So that's um, that's what we had. Um, let's see, who was in room two? Looks like um, Ted and Bardis and Philemon. We unfortunately didn't uh, get to quite the right place for taking notes, so we were uh, inconsistent. Oh, okay. we were inconsistent with the community conventions. <laughs> Oh no, um, this this activity was not uh, interoperable between the groups. But you know, I think um, one thing we talked about was CF and ACDD working really well, and and then tools that are using them, AirDAP, and then um, you know the stuff that Adam was talking about, frictionless data is is CSV basically, and there's um, Bardis mentioned the uh, Rosetta and sort of the equivalence between um, C, uh, CSV and, and NetCDF in, um, in some ways. Uh, and, and then we also talked about the importance of being able to extend uh, standards in some standard and, and machine interpretable way, and then also to evolve standards. Um, so uh, one thing that came up a couple of times was the use of groups in uh, for organizing data and metadata and net CDF files. And we thought that was, it was, it was nice to see uh, communities that are using those, those, that evolutionary step quickly. Um, nothing worse than evolving something and then have nobody come to the party. Definitely. <laughs> uh, Great, thank you. Um, so I guess we'll go to room three, which is Chris and Matt.
Um, I guess I can summarize a little bit w about what we talked about. Um, sort of one of the things that we noticed um, f from a very high level is that in oceanography, we tend to be very tied to this idea of a cruise. Um, and just generally that can be a little limiting for data that wasn't necessarily collected on a cruise or you know other types of data or, or people from other fields that don't, um, they don't have any concept of a cruise because they're uh, kind of in a different world. Um, so that was kind of where the discussion came from. I mean, maybe like the cruise should just be a piece of metadata, not the way you organize metadata completely around it. So. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Especially with the more automated tech coming out and major drives for automation drone technologies. It's time to rethink that. I thought that example that you had, Chris, of the collection of data around that, whatever it was, profiles or something sort of in the Northeast, Northeast U.S., to try and find all the data in that region, regardless of the crews that collected it. I thought that was a good example of the benefits of that concept. And also which, which country collected it as well. You know, I mean, we had to, um, right. Th that is another like sort of siloing factor. And, um, also for, for, um, a lot of bio, Logical data these days, you know, things like Nagoya Protocol and, and sort of legal rights to bioheritage, that's going to add another layer of complexity um, pretty soon. Not for everything, but they were talking about in the deliberations to also extend that to data about biological things, not just the samples themselves. That could be fun. Hmm. Yeah, did you, did you capture that in your notes by any chance? No, no, this is just a grumpy rambling, but I'll put it in the notes. Yeah. Well, I was like, oh, that sounds daunting. Um, I guess, is should we just go through all the rooms or we're, we're kind of running out of time. I'm not sure um, um, what to do, but thumbs up. Yes, go through the rooms. You know, I think that there's, this is the last session of the day. Okay. So okay. there's not really any time pressure. Okay, great, great. You guys will hang out a little bit. Okay, so I guess room four then um, looks like, um, I'm not sure who was in room four. Do, do people know what room they were in or can, can we look it up? Um, let's see. Does it okay. look like That's there are any? Okay, maybe no one. Okay, room four it was empty. Okay, so room five, maybe not either. Okay, room. Uh, so room four. I can tell you who was in those rooms if you're curious. Oh no, name uh, and shame. Um, room four. I mean, unless they don't correspond to the breakout rooms, but it looked like it was Adam, Frank, Kai, the other Adam, Jackie. any of those folks, unless they already spoke up. We just briefly discussed um, kind of follow up to Adam's talk. So kind of the, the need for having those reproducible workflows and provenance as part of FAIR. We didn't write any significant notes down though. There wasn't anything super meaningful to come out of our little session. Okay, cool. You just talked about Star Wars the whole time, right? <laughs> Okay. Um, don't do this. Don't do this. This is. No, not. Uh, oh, we didn't even discuss Star Wars. Okay. Glad. Um, room five. Anything? Uh, to, anything to report out? Who's in room five? Was I in room five? No. <laughs> so actually, I think we should move to room six. I think room five may okay. not have had anyone in, in it, but Stace, you were in room six. Okay. Here. Great. Yeah, I was in, it's, oh, let me turn my video on for a second. 
Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, I was in room six with a number of other folks and I admit I'm on East Coast and I've been online all day. So we did not take any notes. However, we did the important job for each zip, which is we built community in our room. I, I think it's just the most important thing was to meet everyone, learn why we were there, learn a little bit about the marine data cult cluster. And I feel like I made some good connections. Awesome. Best, best. <laughs> um, okay, I guess um, seven, oh, Jack, Jessica, um, and others. I guess I'll go. Um, so I think we talked, so we talked about, um, Things that went well were that using GPS has helped a lot because now you can get the same temporal and horizontal reference frames um, with your instruments. Uh, it doesn't necessarily apply, I think, uh, maybe to the vertical frame, so maybe that can be done better. Um, you uh, Having CF metadata conventions and self-describing file formats has made it easier to use data. Um, and submitting data, if you're a data producer, to the data source has become easier over time. Uh, something uh, that could be better is there's still a lot of very domain specific things. Like if you're an ecologist and you want to use physical oceanography data, forget it. You need a physical oceanographer. Um, so how do we bring more like cross domain data usage um, across into the field? And I guess that's something that, that the marine data cluster could help with. Definitely. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, great. Room eight, uh, maybe someone already reported out from this group, but Karen, uh, Pierre, uh, Raisa, a couple of others. Um, yeah, so we, we took notes in the slide. I think we found the right place. Um, we didn't talk about what's working well. We said we need to prioritize what's not. Um, we talked quite a lot about what could be done better. And the main thing there is um, really getting the data side plugged into the science side in a little bit more like observatories do um, in terms of providing infrastructure data projects, checks and balances kind of inform um, uh, scientists or other operators when something's going wrong. You know, this is the sort of flagging things. And often um, the, the point was raised that also often marines, marine data generation is based on a collection of activities happening on a cruise ship or something rather than a coherent observation campaign. So that creates an interoperability problem um, ab initio. So that's something to take a look at. How can the cluster help? Well, um, it's again, finding out what's, what's already working so we don't have to worry about it. Um, look at other fields about if they've solved things, you know, do a bit of outreach. And then this idea of um, showing the utility of marine data folks in um, detecting on the data level uh, where things are not working and pushing that up back to operations and science and saying, hey, did you guys notice this? Is this a real thing? And then that last point we discussed, I put it into the notes, things like the Nagoya protocol and being sensitive to some of the legal issues popping up around data. Um, I put a couple of notes where people say, this is great. And others people say, uh oh, this is going to mess us up. So building links to groups like uh, MBON, so um, in GeoBON, IPBES, and the Goose BioEco panel, that's, uh, I'm, I'm part of that. So that's like a you know, full disclosure there. But we do worry about that sort of stuff quite a lot. And we'd be happy to provide input. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll follow up on that for sure. Um, and then was there anyone in room nine or 10? Or was that? I think, um, I guess that, okay, so that's it. We made it. Um, so, um, so, so we are like out of time for the session. I guess we, we can hang out and talk in the room, but I know, you know, I'm sure people have things to do. Uh, but so the idea was, you know, thank you so much everyone for coming and doing these exercises. I know that it's kind of like a new um, format and a platform. Um, but the idea was here to just collect people's thoughts and be able to, um, you know, have uh, a follow up through, through, through the marine data cluster. We, we do meet uh, twice a month on the second and third Thursdays at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time um, on, on Zoom. Um, and so um, 
like we will go through these notes and kind of um, create some kind of like steps forward from this. And uh, I thought that was really helpful and useful um, to see some kind of success stories and then how, you know, to make things even better. Um, so Steve, I don't know if you had anything else um, to, to close no, up with. I wanted to say that, you know, this is uh, this group was formed for an information exchange um, specific to uh, marine data. And so, you know, please come back here, even people that are in domains that are, <clears throat> you know, such as atmospheric science and, and uh, we had um, some solid earth people and marine geology. Um, we want to make this as a place where this type of information is exchanged between people and accelerate the improvements in science. So we hope to see you here, you know, twice a month and um, sign up for the marine data cluster um, uh, mailing list if you can. Yeah. I feel like hey, right Steve. Here. Yeah. Uh, or Carolina, can I ask a question yes. before people migrate? Yes, definitely. Oh, we had, we talked a lot about CF. Um, uh, how are people feeling or, or finding useful the CF standard names? Are you guys using those? I mean, they're sort of an interesting part of the CF conventions. Any any thoughts on that or how well that's working? Okay. Good we have a person on the call who can speak directly to that. Andrew? Yeah, maybe Varna wants to comment. I, I will comment. I'm a huge, I've been a huge proponent of it, but um, I don't know if Varna does want to share, but um, you know, recently I kind of watched. Uh, um, hi. Okay. You, you, uh, you there. Hmm, I don't know. It's the the. They seem good. The issue that we've kind of run into is that there's there's like a. Uh, like it's it's hard to know what the CF standard name. Is talking. I I don't know how to put it. Like it's our, our community, the data that we manage, cares a lot about the way you measured something, mm -hmm. and the CF standard names don't capture that. And I don't know. It just seems like there's kind of like when when you when we talk about it, there's a lot of confusion about what that thing is supposed to be because when we'll say like oh this is the standard name for this there's if you're unfamiliar with cf you will assume that that's supposed to be the net cdf variable name and and none of these standards talk at all about variable names and if they do it's usually like a footnote that says we don't standardize that these are supposed to be attributes um where, where do you work andrew i i work with carolina and steve diggs at um scripts i guess is where i am SDCHDO. Yeah. and you might want to you might want to focus some energy on figuring out where that is you know it sounds like you might be confused <laughs> just kidding well i mean just to add to the real confusion <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not helping <laughs> um yeah so i mean it seems it seems useful and that like i know that this is the, the concern, the primary thing that CF standard names are supposed to do is that these numbers are comparable with these other numbers. Um, the issue that comes up is not every community thinks that certain things are comparable with each other. And I was like, you know, for the last uh, two weeks, right, I'm, I was asking for essentially a name to talk about what temperature pH is at. And that's because the, the oceanographic pH community does not consider pH measurements comparable without a temperature. And I kind of had to like hammer that in that like it will be omitted from our data sets if we don't have a temperature. We'll still give you the numbers, but you'll have to go get them yourself because it's, you know, like it's not comparable. So, you know, you. you it's, it's the best thing that we have. And I can't think of a better way of doing it. I mean, are, are, is anybody working with any alternatives to, to CF names that you guys are aware of? I mean, the reason I asked is because it is sort of a, a rough spot in the CF conventions, right? I mean, these, 
I can. I I consider it to be, so the what the, the kind of level above the alternate tends to be like full on ontological databases that try to kind of capture all sorts of stuff. And, and, and that's what we're using at Pico Demo is, or we're not using it. We're looking at using like the nerd vocabulary for describing variables mm -hmm. where you have the term, what it was used to measure, what, what, where it was measured, what, what, you know, was it measured in the water and the air and all the specifics, the entire ontology to fully describe that actual observation. Um, but at the CF workshop, there was discussion about pointing to other vocabularies instead yeah, just, of just limiting it to the CF standard name vocabulary. Yeah, right, and just to, I've, I've just to chime in from the... The, the NERC one kind of be a little funny thing when people talk about the CF standard names and, and that particular name server is it's like the CF names are in that server. Like that's part of their workflow. Well, I think that's where the marine data cluster can help and we can have somebody from NERC give the presentation to describe what NERC is because it's, yes, they ingest CF, but then they also have their own entire ontology for their own vocabulary. So I think it would help enlighten everybody. Okay, yeah. well, um, Roy, so just, just, Roy, uh, just Roy a note on that, that. Just, just a note on that. So like, um, so Gwen Moinclough was uh, one of the lead developers at the NERC thing. She'll, we invited her to attend our visioning uh, the Semantic Federation, the ontology or the for, for ESIP as part of the semantic committee activity. And I'll just put in the, um, the chat a link to some of what we're up to there because the vocabularies and ontologies that we're using in the suite slash um, oboe space that is in earth science, we're mapping to each other. So um, the goal there is that if there's a NERC, think of it this way, if there's like a BODC expression of the CF names, it's just the, sa the same concepts, ideally. It depends on their memorandum of understanding with CF but it's expressed in a technology that allows machines to understand that a little bit better. Then we map to it on the ontology side, which is even more expressivity, but most people won't need it, but some people do. So there's a, there's a link there, but again, it's, it's too much to go into right now. But I think, uh, as I proposed above, some kind of little working group between the semantic tech and the marine cluster might be really worthwhile because all it needs inside the um, file structure is an IRI pointing to what you mean. But what's really important there is that there's an understanding, preferably between CF and those vocabularies, whichever one's being used, that this is a thing. You know, it's not just something that is spun up for, for the fun of it, so to speak, right? There needs to be some sort of agreement and policy there. I think one of the things that needs to be said here is um, any discussion on changing technologies, adopting vocabularies needs to be coupled with how do you resource that work? because there's a lot of theoretical things that will happen that people wish they can do. And I've watched um, uh, Andrew go through it with the CF to the point that he got very involved, but we need to resource that work and have it in our scope of work for any project. For a lot of the repositories here, you know, we exist from grant to grant. And so the scope of work has to include activities like this. And I think one of the things that program managers need to be sensitive to is we're never going to be